All right, it's recording. Awesome. Well, um, welcome to Startup Grand University of Minnesota, our first fireside chat of 2021. My name is Ben Ide. I graduated the University of Minnesota twice, uh, most recently in 2018 with a master's in science, technology, and environmental policy. And Rahul, one of my old classmates from the university, mm -hmm. has invited me uh, back as an alumni co-director of Startup Grind U of M. Uh, today, we are also joined by Dick Polifnik from Online Growth hey, Systems. Everybody. Um, who I think has some really, uh, he's been working on so many interesting things in the time that we've known him. Uh, we thought he'd be a really great resource to help current U of M students who are thinking about entrepreneurship and trying to determine where the path leads. Um, to start today's conversation, we're here because of Startup Grind. This is a global, or at least national, I believe global organization mm -hmm. of people like us who care about startups and the you know, building our skills so that we can start our own uh, one of these days. We're all about giving first. You know, it's the, the startup world can feel siloed at times, but this is a community where we share freely. We help others. It's all in alignment. And it's about making friends, not just networking. That's kind of the goal of being here today. Uh, here's a little bit more information about me and Rahul. Rahul, do you want to Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Hi, everybody. I, as, as Ben already introduced, I am a chapter director at the University of Minnesota Startup Grind chapter, and also I'm a PhD student. Um, yeah. And I'm looking forward to the talk with Dick. We are really honored to have him here uh, on our call. And yep, let's take it forward. Ben is going to take the lead. And if I have some questions, I will also pop in, but I'm going to be like a listener and just observing and learning more from this conversation today. Excellent. And our guest of honor today will introduce himself in just a moment. Um, I have gotten to know Dick, you know, back when in-person events were a thing. You know, he's spoken <laughs> at the mini demo annual conference. He has hosted his own series of startup pitches at, I believe, WeWork in the North Loop. And he's probably done a million other things that I'm just not paying enough attention to keep up with. Um, but he's always trying something new, bringing people together and hustling. Uh, it brings a lot of skills to the table, I think are applicable to just about anybody, especially student entrepreneurs. So I'm gonna get rid of this PowerPoint uh, so we can focus on him. So um, I don't know, start us off, Dick, in about 90 seconds, give us an overview of where you are today and what's your journey like? Sure. So it's hard to talk about the entrepreneur without mentioning the companies, right? So I'll do my best to kind of give a big blanket statement, but my name is Dick Plipnik. I'm super excited to be the first guest of 2021, uh, kicking off another virtual event here. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I actually, normally I would start out my story with saying that I, my first business was uh, selling my sibling stuffed animals on a fold-out card table on the sidewalk in front of my parents' home. But that business got the kibosh for supply chain issues, uh, if you catch my drift there. But uh, I was actually thinking back, and I, I remembered that I had an even earlier business before that. And I was just telling my sister about this the other day, that I used to print out little business cards with my parents' home phone number, and I would put tape on them and like to laminate them and I would hand them out at like parades. Like I would just walk in the parade, wouldn't sign up for them. I was like just a little kid. And uh, <laughs> that business I thought never went anywhere because nobody ever called. And then years, years later, my I asked my mom, we were joking about it and she says, oh no, people called you. But I always told them that you were too busy to take the job <laughs> because she, it was a detective company. So I was gonna go solve crime. <laughs> you were Encyclopedia Brown. Yeah, I, I was a, a big fan of Nate the Great back in the day. Those were the books that inspired me. But uh, so that I recently have now I have to start saying that that was my first business, I guess. But uh, so I've been serial entrepreneur. I've probably done a, a dozen little businesses on the side from high school to college and, and after. And it's been a really, really fun journey and that I'm continuing to learn. So by no means am I a, an expert in anything, but I hopefully can provide some experience to some of the student entrepreneurs or, or, or uh, entrepreneurs. So we have a lot of people at our company who are entrepreneurs within our organization. Um, 
is an example. So hopefully we can share some knowledge today. I'm excited. We are we're excited too. Um, the I think you already started answering this. The can first I? thing we like to hear from entrepreneurs is, you know, how did entrepreneurship make itself part of your story? It sounds like it you were immersed in this early. How? Tell us more about why that felt so natural for you, and how yeah, it was built on that natural predilection. Yeah, it's it's uh it definitely has built in cycles. Like you know, you get smaller, you invest capital, time, then you get bigger, and so it's like a spiral upward. If that makes sense, when you're looking at like a graph, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of just been in my DNA. Started out, I was the kid selling lemonade in the summertime, sibling stuffed animals. I sold gum out of my locker. My godmother gave me a one gallon bucket of, uh, I can't remember the uh, hubba bubba, you know, chewing gum and it was all flavored. And I was not, I, I like spearmint and that was it. Like I didn't like all the fun flavors. So I sold, uh, you could buy um, a, a piece of gum for a quarter or three for 50 cents. And I sold that uh, throughout junior high. And uh, that was, I would always use the money that I made every day to buy the extra little candies at lunch, you know, the candy that I did like. So, <laughs> so uh, lots of stuff. It was just definitely in my DNA. You know, I had a leather briefcase where I didn't even barely know, barely knew how to spell my name. So the R is backwards because I used to go by Richard when I was a little kid. Uh, and uh, it just kind of escalated from there. You know, one business got bigger and bigger and I was able to invest capital and the profits from the previous venture into the next one. And and it slowly just escalates. And that's a very common practice. Even, you know, uh, I'm doing it in the micro because I'm only in my 20s. But, you know, eventually that'll hopefully, fingers crossed, build up to, you know, some of the stories that you look at of uh, other entrepreneurs who have, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs that are really famous today. People only know them for one business. You know what I mean? But they've actually had three or four experiences prior to the one that they're known for. Uh, so if you actually look at like, the background and like the roadmap of how to get to that spot. It's a lot of practice. It's a lot of learning. It's a lot of building on your previous success to get to that next level of entrepreneurialism, if that makes sense. So just trying to follow the, the model that uh, that's already been proven out, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, you know, otherwise I'd try be buying lottery tickets. So. Exactly. I think that the, first of all, I noticed right away, the spiraling upward pattern you were describing. That's the graph mm -hmm. in the top left right of your screen by your logo yes that's even yeah it's even inspired uh the logo i didn't even realize to put that together but you're totally right uh what my experience has been in entrepreneurship you know what i mean throughout the dozen little side businesses from gum to um i had a lawn care and landscaping company in high school by the time i graduated um high school i had 21 of my peers working for me as employees so it was a and i bought out one of my competitors and i was like 16 years old. So big deal for me, at least at the time. And then, uh, you know, I had a, a manufacturing company in my early twenties and, and now I've got a company called online growth systems. And that's a good point. And that, uh, it's, uh, actually reflective of my journey so far, but that's actually how not just entrepreneurship works, but marketing works and business works and frankly life, you know what I mean? And at least unless you're like one of the few exceptions, you know what I mean? This is, per, this is, if you're doing things right, this is what it's going to look like. And uh, that's inspired our logo. So yeah, this is that's a good point to mention. This is my current company, Online Growth Systems. We've been going strong for uh, just over five years now. And it's been a wild, wild journey, obviously, <laughs> roller coaster. Roller coaster upward, though. Yeah, I can imagine. And that's, again, a perfect segue. You know where we're going here. Uh, you're working on Online Growth Systems full time now. I think you just talked about even hiring people to this job, not just your lawn mowing company. like. Tell us more. What's mm -hmm. what's where are you currently, and how do you see things moving forward? We are filming this in March of 2021, when there are some positive signs around COVID. So we have our fingers crossed. Yes, I just got the phone call the other day that I was approved for the vaccine because I'm a I got a kidney transplant when I was uh, 19. So uh, no, yes, I was 19 when I got my kidney transplant. So I was uh, I'm now I just. They're just getting to that portion of the list, you know, it goes like, you know, old people, teachers, you know, uh, medical staff. And then finally they got to the kidney transplants. So I'm uh, getting it soon. But uh, anyway, so segueing off of that, uh, uh, remind me your question again. Sorry. <laughs> I, I got distracted by the COVID thing too. Um, 
tell us more about online growth systems, where you're at today, where you hope to yes. go. And maybe yeah, how it's so too. That's a great idea. So kind of the origin story was like many of my businesses, uh, this one started by accident and uh, it was also known as serendipity, right? Or luck, I guess you could say. Uh, and definitely my, my grandfather used to say that uh, I would rather be the luckiest man in the world than the most hardworking man in the world. So, uh, you know, take that with a grain of salt because there's much deeper meaning to that. But uh, I, I really thought about that. And there's a lot of principles around creating your own luck and making sure that you're at the right place at the right time with the right resources. So a good example is last year, the stock market went down and, you know, right now it's being volatile, but if when a lot of people were pulling out, um, you know, it would have been a good time to put money into the stock market and you potentially could have doubled your money this last year in, in a matter of six months. Right. So, you know, having, being at the right place in the right time, knowing what to identify as the patterns and then having the resources with it and, stock markets last year, in that case, it would be capital to be able to seize that opportunity. Because if you have uh, a great example, it's one of my favorite stories. Um, Jerry Wein, uh, Weinstein, I think is that, no, no, not Weinstein, uh, Weinstraub, holy cow, yeah. So Jerry Weinstraub was the uh, manager for Elvis. And the reason he got that gig is because he met with his business manager and said like, hey, I really want to get into the entertainment industry. I want to manage Elvis. And he just had bigger guts and more courage than other people that he got a meeting with the guy, had zero experience and just said, I want to be Elvis's manager. And he said, okay, I'll make you a deal, kid. If you show up here tomorrow with a million dollars in cash to like invest, you can be Elvis's manager. And uh, this kid called every person he knew. He was, you know, he was probably in his 20s at the time. And I might be butchering this, the details of the story, but he called every person he knew. And like an hour before the deadline, he finally got enough money he needed. And this is back like a long, you know, this is yeah, this is like how many years ago. Modern day. Exactly, exactly. So he got the money he needed and you know, went there and he said, here's the check. You know what I mean? It's it's good. You no. Know? And then uh he said that he made the money back within like one week because they split it three ways between the business manager, um, the, you know, his promoter and then uh, Elvis himself. So they split everything three ways and just made a killing and he made all that money back within seven days. It was, it's unreal, crazy story, but being at the right place at the right time and then having the resources in that place, he had connections. In last year's case with the stock market, you need the capital and the experience to identify the patterns, right? And in my case, it's just been a matter of um, seizing those opportunities when they present themselves. So that was a long-winded answer to um, the company I had before this was uh, actually U of M is very, very much in line with Minnesota Cup. And I was, I actually had a company at the time in 2017, it was called Rhino Tools. And it was a manufacturing company that actually so one thing spurred the next, if I rewind even further. Mm -hmm. So the landscaping company, I had employees that we were breaking a shovel per week with the landscaping jobs. And I was getting really sick of buying $50 shovels once a week because that was a lot of money for an 18 year old, right? So yeah. my frustration went to my cousin's house and we welded and invented a better shovel. Sounds dumb, worked awesome. Uh, long story short, had a patent pending. I had investors lined up, went to the Minnesota Cup, uh, placed in the semifinals. Uh, had really good success with that company and throughout like Minnesota Cup and other networking events and other business competitions at the time, uh, a lot of people are saying, oh my gosh, who made your video? Who made your website? Who's doing your marketing? They're doing a fantastic job. We want to hire that firm. And then I would say, well, I guess you have to hire me because I'm the one who's doing all of that just out of necessity, right? Didn't have the capital to hire an outside firm. So I took it as at what was at first a side venture, just kind of for fun because I enjoyed it. And about, you know, a year later, um, actually, no, it was around that same time. No. Yeah. So throughout that process, I realized that I was actually not just enjoying it, but it was extremely lucrative. It was a lot of fun and I was really, really naturally good at it. So I took that and, uh, actually went back to school, uh, about a year later to learn software development, because as that business grew, I saw an opportunity to have more competency in web development and software development, in addition to like the media and marketing pieces. And then just one piece of that business, like the graph shows, built upon the next, right? 
uh, whether it's investing time or resources, or in my case, you know, going back to school for the software development midway through the business, um, it, everything, you know, caused that snowball effect. You know what I mean? That, that as like, if you're familiar with the snowball effect is, you know, it rolls down the hill, it gets bigger and bigger and just gains momentum. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's how online growth systems was born. And now, uh, we, uh, we're a 10 person company. Uh, and just full transparency for the for the students that are listening and anybody else who's listening, um, that sounds sexy, but in a lot of agency, you know, in the agency world, the real the reality is half of them are full time and the other half are part time, you know, contractors. And then we have another team of about ten um, developers that we partner with because that's just tis the nature of scaling. And I did not I'm bootstrapping everything right now, so didn't raise any capital for this business. Um, and that's just the model that we're following so far. And it's been a really awesome journey. And just yesterday um, at like 8 p.m. last night, I just got uh, a signature for our newest uh, full-time employee. So for us, that's a big deal. So uh, very excited about that. Yeah, thank you. Very excited. There's your long-winded answer. <laughs> it's a long journey. And you did hit on one of the points I was meaning to bring up if you didn't, which is that like each time I've met you, you've learned something new that just adds to your skill set, whether it was like, you know, if you go to dickpolipnik.com and you scroll to the bottom of the page of categories of things you talk about, there are entrepreneurship, marketing, uh, tech. I think you've helped, you found like a cybersecurity training course a couple of years ago. And it sounds mm -hmm. like you can weld. I didn't even know that before we got on the call. Or you know someone who can weld and you know enough about landscaping to know what the user wants. Um, the next section of these conversations is, you know, skills, you know, advice for students, things you've learned through your journey and through your leadership. So I want to, I want to focus just for my own curiosity on that idea of the snowball effect, taking these skills and sure. just packing more around the core, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. taking up whichever direction you want. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think maybe to just slightly go off that course. I think a more realistic example, especially for the students that are listening is life isn't really like a snowball unless you say that like occasionally it'll hit a rock and it'll get a little bit smaller, but then it'll gain momentum, get a little smaller, gain a little momentum. It's closer to the graph, like we were saying earlier, right? Yep, exactly. So with every business uh, has come greater scale, greater profit, more, you know, greater networks, um, every, every aspect has increased, uh, including happiness, right? Uh, so that's another th important thing to think about, especially for young people is, is uh, you know, we're faced with more information and more opportunities and more of everything than any generation has ever faced ever. So it's really, especially today, like everybody says like, oh, well, they've been saying that for thousands of years that every generation has it. Oh, it's way harder for us back in the day. But like, I disagree. I think that like with technology really, really advancing things the last 200 years, particularly the last like 50, like we've seen that like time has kind of like gone like this, but then like it hit, you know, a hundred years ago and it just shot up, right? With the invention of Know, the internet essentially making information so accessible at the click of a button now there's so many new things that are introduced you know i think everybody's going to have carpal tunnel in 50 years you know what i mean <laughs> you know from being on computers like that wasn't a problem that existed 100 years ago you know carpal tunnel did but people weren't on computers every day uh so i think not only are those physical things going to be coming into play but i think it's important to think how technology and this is coming from a futurist and from a technologist right like i'm a developer i own a media company you know we build software for a living like i'm very much in like what's the next thing i was uh i have mentors who uh were mining bitcoin when it was like two dollars you know what i mean like very very like eat sleep and breathe that world but i'm also skeptical of it in the sense that like we have there's like that balance to play of you know, having your mental health and as is important. So that's another thing I just wanted to kind of throw that brief touch point on is, as you know, obviously capital is important, success is important, building a company. Uh, one of my favorite things is like what I just did last night at 8 p.m. is being able to provide a job, like a really, really good job. Like it's really important, even as a small company that we have like, we have a 
benefits package that can go head to head with some Fortune 500s. You know what I mean? Because it's really important to me that we provide that. That's part of like what's important to the DNA of a company is that it's not just good for the founder, but it's good for the team, and it's good for the clients, and it's good for the users and everybody involved. And that I think is actually going to be beneficial long term. And it's a good long term play, especially like let's say ten years from now, I'm doing the next venture. I want that reputation going into the next venture to say like, hey, his last company exited for X dollars. But that's going to be obviously that's going to be the first thing everybody mentions is like the dollar metric. But then the next thing that they're going to say is, man, every employee who's ever worked at that company that he just exited from loved it. Like they think he's the greatest. Um, like they would uh, like it's kind of like my family's big into history. It's kind of like that, like. 300, you know, Spartan warrior mentality of like, you would die for the person next to you kind of a thing, but not that extreme. You know what I mean? <laughs> you would work but... a few extra hours with sure. the person next to you. Right. And right. And, and I'm, and I'm, a, that's another thing I'm extremely conscious of too, is that I work 80 to hundred hours a week, but I do not expect that from my team at all. Um, and in fact, sometimes I'm the opposite. I'm extremely lenient of like, Hey, let's, it's a beautiful day. It's spring. It's Friday. Like I'll just message the team and I'll say, Hey, whatever you're working on, finish it up and take the rest of the day off. It is gorgeous outside. Cause I think that little, that extra three hours at the end of the work week that they're all getting off paid, um, that's going to actually have better productivity and better advocacy, you know, that following week. So I think it's like a way to invest dollars into their productivity the following week. So, um, I really focus on the macro and, and the, or the macro and the micro of how those little adjustments could work. So. Finding the opportunity for active kindness is always appreciated, especially mm -hmm. no, especially when we aren't in person. So it's harder to do you know, the little gestures. Um, Definitely. And as, as students are thinking about you know, mindfulness, creating joy, and mm -hmm. their own entrepreneurial journeys, um, are there resources that you've used to help you know, yourself on this path? Because Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a plethora of resources. If I were to touch on three of them that I that are just coming to my mind, um, number one is be willing to like have self awareness, and maybe this is something that Raul can touch on is that like self awareness and that like mental health is so important. I, I know I've said it like three times already in this um, conversation, but if uh, if you think of not entrepreneur is like a vehicle and you see like the engine engine warning light is kind of getting in that danger zone you need to stop and like let the engine cool down or fill it up with gas or sometimes you got to clean out the car because it's, it's looking messy or whatever or wash the car like there's a million things that entrepreneurs need to keep thinking of because you'll never get to that finish line if you're hitting it on the gas and like never stopping to refill for gas you can't make a cross country trip trip on one tank of gas. You can't. So like if I were to do like really boil it down and everybody, everybody's so into like what I call the hustle porn is that like everybody just works at 80 to hundred hours a week, but then yes, I do that. But then there's some weeks where I work 40 and then I take Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I don't look at one email and I just say, I need a mental breather. Otherwise, I'm going to crash and burn, and I'm, I have to think about this long term and what's the long, the long play here. Because uh, now, if you think about an entrepreneur being a car, now if you're a founder of a company with employees, now you're driving a bus, and the others, there's other people on that bus. And if you get burnt out and you crash, um, you're taking a whole team with you, and that's not that's not good. Obviously, there's somebody else can try to jump in and drive, but you got to think about that pulse. I feel like I've kind of had this like host mask of cheeriness on this whole time. And I'm going to take that off for a second and say, yeah. I have been dealing with burnout and trying to build better habits to know when to step away from things and know when to say, okay, I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on this thing and it's going to be done. And I'm going to see where I'm at. Like, this is critical. And mm -hmm. you've said it better than I can. Yep. Um, I just want to maybe add a small thing on that because this is definitely very close topic to me as well. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that, right? That point of taking care of yourself, right? Because, and like the fact that let's say you are riding the bus, so you know, you need to be careful that, you know, 
to take care of yourself to make sure that everybody in your team is also being taken care of right and they are also yes. taking care of themselves because you set an example for them right so so yeah so on on that actually another point that i was recently reading and you know, i always contemplate that i feel uh, about this balance that you just mentioned right it's kind of like uh, like that that hustle point that talking about let's say people think that okay i'm going to make this much money and then after that the life is going to be all fun right but it's yeah. <laughs> you know see you know but that doesn't happen like it, it's actually about the journey not the destination like they say right so so what i realize that maybe making that balance every day you know not thinking like every day or every week kind of having that balance that you're having a hustle at the same time you're kind of not crossing the lines of your personal you know what your body is mm-hmm. talking telling you right what your mind is telling you right kind of making sure that you're taking care of that entire balance throughout because ultimately assuming that you're going to be in this state forever you know like there's no like final thing mm-hmm. that okay that day i'm going to be rich and everything is going to be perfect and then i'm going to just you know go to the beach you know because a lot of people who have actually become you know big as well and gone to the beach for like few months and then they realize they don't like that either you know they want to come back and do something else so it's it's kind of managing that balance throughout in your entire journey is i mm-hmm. think uh, is a very key thing according to me something that i feel but as yeah and i love that and, and to kind of like touch on that note too is you're saying like take that pulse daily you know what i mean so like how am i doing today and one thing i that i really liked and i've just kind of adapted for me and i could this is just my on this is my working theory if anybody's familiar with the 4 hour work week which most people are especially the entrepreneurial community um that author Tim Ferriss he has something what he calls um i think he calls it like attention credits or something like that focus credits or something do you guys know what i'm do you remember what the term is i, I see head nods that you're familiar with the term but i understand like the concept is something like decision fatigue the more decisions you make exactly exactly so yep so it was essentially like they sent it was like important like brain credits like brain juice right like if let's say that every day you are given 100 coins and every time you have to make a hard decision or really ex- expend brain power on writing a final essay for a class um reading through a legal document as an entrepreneur before you sign it um making a decision like should you hire this employee should you take on this new client what should you where should you invest your dollars for the next initiative to grow the company like those spend a lot of energy versus let's say that like answering an email might let's say that a, a big decision spends 10 coins answering an email spends 5 and then like uh you know i'm trying to think of something that's less than that uh maybe like doing meaningful tasks like uh, watering a plant yeah watering a plant is is only like half of a coin right exactly so one thing that's that's tim ferris's theory is that every day that you're given 100 and like how are you going to spend that are you going to spend it on this decision that's actually a lot of mental work but it's not going to impact you that much or are you going to spend it on hey i'm going to do a b and c today and then i'm going to take the day off because those are important and that's say that's where the 80 20 rule comes in or the pareto principle um so my ongoing theory to to echo what rule said is that i think that every day you wake up with a different amount of credits So instead of every day you wake up with 100, I think that like some days you wake up and you have 150 and you're like I am I woke up early for some reason before my alarm clock. I'm like extremely productive. Yeah, it's like yeah, exactly Ben, you feel like you're in a rocky, you know, montage. Like you're getting ready to fight the bad guy. And uh that's where where the nights when I know that I wake up and I'm like holy crap, I feel awesome. I need to double down. I need to double down and I say I'm going to cancel my whatever i had going on this evening that was that i can easily reschedule and i'm just going to work till like 2 3 4 in the morning because i have the energy and i have the motivation and i have the stamina and like i'm like getting everything done and it's and the outcome is crap you know what i mean it's it's quality and quantity both are there that's when i would start that's when i put in like the you know i'm going to bed when the sun's rising and then i get 2 hours of sleep and wake up and start over but then vice versa sometimes when you wake up you're like hey instead of your 100 credits that you might be used to you wake up and you only have 50 and you're like man i got to be really really choice with where i'm going to spend these credits today and i've got these zoom calls already built into my calendar so um i'm going to go to those but uh that actual that huge project i was going to do it in this afternoon like i don't have the mental capacity to do it and what normally would take me 2 hours to do it is going to take me 4 if i do it today because i don't have the brain juice to do it i don't have the credits right so that's my ongoing theory is taking tim ferris's idea and saying that i think you wake up with different values 
every day. And uh, I think mindfulness, like Raul was saying, and taking that daily pulse, and and Ben, you were saying about having that, you know, self awareness of like having that balance every day, and like making sure you're eating right, you're sleeping right, you're having that friends and family connection outside of work. I think that's going to give you higher credits over a longer period of time. Versus if you have burnout every day, you're going to wake up with fewer and fewer credits and pretty soon you're, you crash. And then, cause every day you're waking up and you have zero and that's called depression and you can't get out of bed. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's a very long pontificated rabbit hole. We just went down, but I think that those were, the, that was amazing. That was really well said, actually. That was amazing. What you just shared. Yeah. Thanks. I think that's the first time I've verbalized it. I've always thought about that internally, but I've been kind of like crafting that the last few months here. So could be wrong though. <laughs> that's my going if, theory. If I were to add something to your working hypothesis, which seems reasonable to me, it matches my experience. Yeah. It would be to look for the activities that rather than having to put your coins in to participate in, you know, mm -hmm. give you the coins back and figure yeah. out how to build those into your day, you know, going for a walk or checking mm -hmm. in with a friend or family member, uh, whatever floats your boat, reading a book. I can tackle on that, Ben. I love reading. I, I, I'm actually not at my place right now, but um, if I was, I would show you guys, I've got like shelves and shelves of books of, and 99 out of a hundred of them are self-improvement business or some technology like you know, blockchain or, or whatever. Um, and I experienced, I was doing great at work, but then I was like, really like, man, all these books are starting to sound the same. And there's, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But what I did is then I reintroduced like a good sci-fi novel that I'm a huge sci-fi guy as well. And I read uh, Ender's Game again. And I've read mm -hmm. that probably six times throughout my life. And I love the Ender's Game series. And it was like, just taking that breather from you know, normally when I read an entrepreneurial book or a business book, it gives me credits, but I like the, like the value is diminishing over time that I was only getting one credit per book when before I was getting 10. And I was like, man, I got to like read a sci-fi novel. And then, then I got 50 coins from that. And then I was able to go back to the business books and they were, I was getting the mental value is just as much as I was getting the educational value again. So it's a great point, Ben. We should talk more about science fiction offline. <laughs> Or yeah. online at a different time. Are you a Dune uh, fan? I just got to ask. <laughs> say again? Are you a Dune fan? Dune? I've only read the first two. Well, that's is, more than me. So I'll say uh, that's probably a yes then because those books are huge. So <laughs> um, if I were going to boost science fiction writer at the moment, I would talk about N.K. Jemisin. Uh, she's a black female U.S. author who writes really compelling fantasy and science fiction. Um, Very cool. Yeah, the Broken Earth trilogy is the one that I'm still kind of working my way through. Awesome. Yeah, I've actually heard of that one. But uh, uh, to, to finish uh, my thought on the other two out of those three things I was going to mention before, I'll just give the bullet points. Um, so one, um, having that mental health thing. The second resource I think are peers. So you hear of CEO peer groups. Like if you're not at a point, the point where you're running a seven figure company, figure out where your peers are and have conversations with them. When I was in college, I would invite uh, the other entrepreneurial students out to dinner. I would, I wouldn't do it through a club. I wouldn't do it through a class. I would identify the people in the entrepreneurial classes that actually I thought were in, like actually going to do something with it. And, uh, you know, say with that what you must, but, uh, but uh, we would meet up at like a pizza joint that was because everybody was broke and we were just, you know, dirt cheap food and we would sit there and we would talk and uh, it was great. Um, so the third resource is if those were where your peers are at, the best thing and the biggest thing I can attribute my success so far to, and you ask anybody and like, I don't think I'm successful yet. Like, I'm with, like, my brain, it's like the goal always gets bigger. And then when you get there, you're like, man, I still don't feel like I'm successful. You know, the bar gets raised and you meet it and it keeps that. It's just like this, right? But uh, the biggest thing is uh, talking to people who have been there, done that. And uh, I think mentors and, and not just your professors in school, but people outside of school, go talk to um, CEOs of companies, of, com of industries that you want to be in someday. Uh, 
take them to lunch and you buy lunch. The best quote I ever, one of my favorite quotes was, uh, I think it was from uh, Warren Buffett. He said, poor people should buy rich people lunch more often because they're the ones that are getting the value, more value out of it. So I thought that was interesting and I've lived by that. Even when I've had two pennies to rub together, I've always, um, <laughs> when I was a broke college kid, I would take a, a CEO out to lunch. And of course, where do they want to go? They want to go to the $200 steakhouse. And I would be like, oh my God, I've never spent this much on a meal in my life. You know, and I would order like the salad with water, you know, <laughs> but um, it's proven that if I learned a million dollar piece of advice, that $200 investments obviously paid for. So, yep. That is, I like the moxie of that technique and I will heartily endorse to any U of M students that you can learn a lot of things at the university, but there's so much that is really hard to learn from professors who became professors by pursuing that long road that leads to a PhD. Um, and so much more you can learn by the people who are making it up as we go um, <laughs> out in the real world. So um, we are taking a lot of time with these questions, which is awesome. I appreciate the depth of insight you're bringing here, Dick. Um, Rahul, I know you came to this with a handful of questions for Dick. And then I wanted to close out our conversation by giving Dick a chance to, you know, remind us where we can find him online. So yeah. Good awesome. for you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So uh, I'll I I I will just ask one question, which I think really wanted to maybe ask. But before even I go to that question, just on your last point. Uh, so the three bullet points, maybe I, I'm not sure. So you said mental health is the first thing. Then second thing was peer group or resources in peer group or second two separate things, is it? What was the third point? I think I missed the third point probably. So the three points are um, having that mental health, thinking about that was like the whole credits conversation. Second point is having a peer group of people who are in the trenches with you at the, they're dealing with the same problems, that support system. And then the third bullet point was uh, uh, mentors and, and okay. taking people out to lunch who have been where you want to go. Okay. 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 Awesome. Yeah. That was really good. And I actually kind of relate, you know, like, uh, you know, that saying where, you know, you are average of the top five people you spend the time with and stuff, right? So you definitely get influenced mm -hmm. a lot by the people around you. Like, you know, um, like if you see somebody who is hustling, you kind of can feel that energy of hustling. Right. So, mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I love that fact of peer group, even, uh, in whatever you want, like just sharing more perspective on that, not let's say, you know, for example, um, I have, I like riding motorcycle by the way. Right. Mm -hmm. So like right. for me to kind of have a friend, let's say who rides a motorcycle as well, kind of keeps that habit going that even, even like time goes by and like, I have somebody who can, who's doing it. So I can watch that and, you know, I can get excited mm -hmm. to continue doing with that person. So like generally having that peer group of whatever habits that you want to kind of build in your life or, you know, whatever things that you want to grow on. I think that's a great, I really loved those three summary key points that you shared. Uh, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So I just have just one last, I think it's a little bigger question though. So you can, you can handle in the way you want the best, but I just wanted to tackle on that, the key point of the growth systems, right? So, so let's say for somebody, whoever who's watching this, right? Like everybody's probably in the really different journeys of their startup. Let's say somebody is like uh, just an idea phase versus their bootstrapping. They have MVP, right? And then the entire journey, I just wanted to maybe understand what's your perspective of like a growth about a startup, like, you know, what have like what's the journey of growth for a startup and what are the key things that you know let's say early stage uh, founders uh, and you know entrepreneurs can do to kind of uh, help their company grow you know what could be the growth strategies that they can employ you know um, i think it's like a, definitely a bigger question to kind of give yeah mm -hmm. i'll unpack that um in two chunks okay. um first one is i think a blanket statement that every industry actually has a different steps Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you're doing, if you're doing a kid in you know, a surgery for a kidney transplant, that's, those are different steps you take to get to that success than you would doing, you know, uh, you know, delivering a baby, right. Those are like very different steps, same, you're wearing the same, using the same tools mm -hmm. and you're using the same resources, but different steps in a different order and different areas, right. It's very different outcomes. <laughs> so, uh, like for us, for like a digital agency and, and a software development company, uh, we took different different steps than my lawn care and landscaping did, than my manufacturing did, uh, especially like, especially in Minnesota. I mean, there's a lot of medical startups here. So if you're in the healthcare industry, those are very, very different steps. Um, 
but same tools, a lot of the same resources, sometimes in a different order, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the first piece of advice is I would say, uh, I'll, 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 I'll kind of give some examples, but you don't want this to be taken as like everybody who listens to this is like, oh, that's the secret. That's the formula. That's the recipe. It's not. It's recipe for particular industries and it's very different and it's and uh you need to do your own due diligence otherwise you're going to fail uh because you're going to try to put the roof on a house that doesn't have any foundation yet and that's not going to work mm -hmm. so that's the first thing i want to touch on the second one is uh, I, I can spit out some examples so let's say that you're building a SaaS company or software as a service so s-a-a-s if you're building a SaaS company you know a lot of people say oh they have like the napkin idea they think of uh uh, I'm, I'm friends with another U of M alumni uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the, the, found, the two, the two co-founders of Float, which is the Airbnb for boats, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Very great. They're doing great. Um, so like if, if you were in that industry, if you're creating a technology company, that's like primarily the product and service is online, it's digital, it's an app, it's a software, it's a tool. Uh, you go from like napkin idea, then you would go to something called like an MVP or minimum viable product or proof of concept, right? Uh, you know what, let's, let's actually make it super, super practical, tactical. So mm -hmm. let's say you've got the napkin idea. A lot of people will start investing a ton of time and dollars into like development. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the, that's doing the wrong steps in the wrong order. I mean, you can do that. It'll take you, if, if you've got the capital, and you've got like a ton of money saved up from maybe a previous business or something, um, go for it. But uh, it's riskier because you're spending a lot of time and money on, let's say that you were, uh, that's like that's like investing a lot of money in the horse industry when Henry Ford was coming out with a car. Like mm -hmm. you're taking a risk there, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a cool way to think about that. You've got a SaaS company, you've got it written on the napkin. Then instead of starting to invest dollars into some building the app, instead you go and you pay a UX designer or something like that to build what's called a UX prototype, mm -hmm. which is user UX stands for user experience. So using a tool um, like Envision software, and you can click drag and drop little blocks. So it looks and feels like it's an app, but it doesn't actually work. So it's like, it's like a design, it's a model, it's fake. It's like, when you see somebody design a house, they've got like the little model, like from the Brady Bunch, you know, before you build the real one. And that is enough to, for a SaaS company, that's enough to raise capital. That's enough to get paid, prepaid users. Then you're not investing your own capital. You're investing investor money or OPM, other people's money, right? Or clients money. So you get a contract. This is what I did with Rhino Tools is I would go, I had the prototype. I didn't invest a ton of money into buying a, buying a manufacturing plant and spending a bunch of money on production of machines. Like I built a very minor, minimal, minimal viable product, right? And in my case, it was an actual shovel that worked, um, but I didn't want to spend my own money on buying the $100,000 mold we would need to really build the final product. So, so the, uh, SaaS and, and manufacturing, maybe this is a similar model. You build the MVP, you take it to users, potential buyers, and you say, hey, uh, hey, UHG, they're in your backyard. Hey, General Mills, they're also in our backyard. Best Buy, there's a lot of Fortune 500s. There's like more Fortune 500s per capita in the Twin Cities than like anywhere else on the planet, like maybe second to like Tokyo, and that's it. You know what I mean? Like we're extremely, there's pros and cons to that. One of the benefits is that like there's a lot of Fortune 500 buyers in your market. Uh, and right in your backyard for U of M students. So use that to your advantage. Use the geography advantages um, to the, the best you can. So you take your MVP to those companies and you say, hey, UHG, I've got this idea for a healthcare app that uh, A, they could be an investor or B, they could be a buyer. Let's say that they're a, they're a user. You say, we were, we're normally going to charge um, you know, $50,000 a year for the subscription to use this software. If you pre-purchase a two year subscription now before we build it, um, we're gonna give it to you for a 75% for a discount. You know what I mean? And then you get you know five figures of money up front because you're get, they're pretty much getting a $75 coupon for two years, but you're getting capital to, and then you do that for UHG, you do it for a couple of other companies, and then you have the capital without losing the equity. So you still hold 100% of the equity or if you have a co-founder that's technical or something, then you're, let's say that you're just you and your co-founders, no investors yet, 
you take that capital from the pre-purchased orders and you build the app with that capital, right? And then, uh, because then you're already, you already know there's going to be buyers. You already have a customer base before you take the risk of investing investors' dollars, your dollars, if you're a technical founder, your time, your talent. Um, so that's a much smarter model. You know what I mean? And I, 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 there's, there's companies in our backyard. I don't want to say any names because I don't know if I'm, I don't want to make sure I don't break any NDA, NDAs, but there's companies that are doing very, very well. And they're like poster childs for Twin Cities tech companies. And that's how they got started is they went to customers first, mm -hmm. raised the money through pre-order discounts and used that capital to build the app. And then boom, you've got Fortune 500s using your app already. And then when you do launch to get all the other users, guess whose logos you can put on your website and say, use that A, B, and C. And like, holy shit, now selling is going to be easy. You know what I mean? So much better model. So um, right, well, I know I kind of went crazy there, but what was that kind of answering your original question? Yeah, yeah, no, no. That was that was really valuable. That was actually on point, and that was a great point. Like ultimately focusing on the customers and kind of you know uh, mm -hmm. driving that entire journey from there. And I and I can totally feel because I'm probably one of the people who kind of let's say got stuck in the journey of building the product before reaching out to the customers and learned for a few things as as in this. Build area. it and they will come, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course, build it and they will come is like a great T-shirt, uh, but. Uh, there's lots of companies that were built and nobody ever came mm -hmm. and everybody's money and time and years of your life got wasted. And I'm and I, another thing to think about is not just the capital and time you spent, but the opportunity cost. You could have spent that time and money on a different company that would have done well. So that's something to think about. Awesome. That was, that was amazing. I think that connects with the closing thing that uh, uh, Ben mentioned that, you know, how, people can find you online and you know how can they take the benefit of uh, the plethora of things that you provide for you know early stage startups and you know and we can close based on that question sure well first of all you guys thank you so much for having me on this has been a blast i uh uh echoing the uh when i was thinking of wine straub and I said Weinstein, I'm like, wait a minute, that's not the right last name. <laughs> that's been in the news, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I thought that was kind of a funny moment, but uh, it's been a really great experience and I, I, I'd i love to get a copy of this recording and thank you to all the students and anybody else who's tuning in. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, for follow, you know, if anybody wants to check out any of our stuff, um, Online Growth Systems is my media company, but uh, we typically work with companies between one, and five, 1 million and 500 million um, in revenue. But uh, another another time that I, or another place that I'm spending a lot of time and resources on uh, is on my personal brand. So if you go to dickpolipnik.com, uh, and that's D-I-C-K, and then my last name is P-O-L-I-P-N-I-C-K.com, and that's where I take a lot of conversations with my mentors, with my you know uh, peer groups and peer groups above me. And what I'm learning in the trenches every day and regurgitating it into a content form through, we have a show, we have a podcast, we have a blog, uh, I do speaking, um, and that's the primary resource that we do it through there. So it's free resources that you can get curated learnings that I'm learning from. Uh, and I just kind of am documenting my, my journey and my learning through there. So that might be a good resource for, the, for anybody tuning in. I spent a little bit of time on Dick's YouTube channel just prepping for this conversation. I, in the snippets I watched, I heard this idea of inbox bankruptcy, where we're all just tired of having so many things in our inboxes and we're narrowing it down to a few. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there are a lot more of those, you know, brain credits uh, and other insights if you check out more of Dick's stuff. Um, really appreciate having you here today on this beautiful summer's day. Um, Nick, and I'm excited to hear about, you know, the growth of online growth systems, about the fact that you're in line for a vaccine. Um, thanks for this conversation. Yeah, yeah. you bet. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, one last little plug is uh, we're hiring like crazy. So uh, U of M students, if you guys got the chops and you want to be part of something cool, uh, uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs in our company. So entrepreneurs that practice within their own company, Bob Iger, the current CEO of Disney is an entrepreneur. He took it from a failing brand to 20 years ago. It's the Disney that everybody knows and loves now. So, uh, uh I'm very much a, a drinker of that Kool-Aid. So, uh, welcome any conversations on that front. If anybody's interested down the road. Awesome.
Thank you, thank you. Let's go. All right. Watch sure. a of applause. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> making margaritas. I heard the thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> All right. Cool. I'll stop sure. recording.